Hi, and welcome to... Wait, <laughs> what is this again? It's been know. a while. It has. It has been a while. We're... Is this a podcast? <laughs> I think so. Uh-huh. Well, that's why we're here. Uh-huh. You guys seem vaguely familiar. Uh-huh. Oh, yes. Classical stuff. That's what this is. <laughs> Welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know. This is a podcast <laughs> about classical education, the classical world, things to do with the an- with antiquity, things to do with the Middle Ages. Heck, we threw in some we throw in some enlightenment there, and uh, <laughs> we just talk about whatever we want to. We, <laughs> but honestly. it usually has to do with education. Okay. And um, but anyway, we are three guys. We work at a classical school called Veritas Academy, classical Christian school here in Austin, Texas. My name is Graham Donaldson, and I am joined by AJ Hannenberg. That's me. And Thomas Fletcher Magby. Hello. And how, yeah. long, how long has it been since we've put an episode when out? We, when, oh, gosh. When did we three last meet again? Uh, um, no, would you believe me if I said November 19th? Was it November? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Would you believe me if I no, said... No, I wouldn't believe you. I, yeah, I, am I look, don't. I am looking Frankly, at our podcast Frankly, I don't believe feed. you. November 19th is what this says. Uh, I do believe we put out a three-minute podcast uh, December explaining 3rd. It was a why very, yes. we weren't uh, here. I believe, Graham, did you do that episode? Yeah, and I still got something oh, wrong. All, all three and a half <laughs> minutes of it. That's really funny. Um, yes. No, it's been a while. But anyway, uh, we are back. Uh, our Christmas season is over. We took a nice little break to be with family and right. to celebrate the birth of our Lord. And we're back, and it's a new year, and ready to cast some pods with you fine fellows. Wonderful. So I guess so. We took Advent off. We took Christmas. We took twelve days of Christmas. We took Epiphany. And we took I think half of New Epiphany. Year's. Yeah, New Year's Epiphany tide. Epiphany. Yeah, Epiphany tide. I mean, I've, probably the Magi are still <laughs> what, exactly. on their way yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly to right. where they're going. Yeah, that's what we were waiting. It for. was and a so, hike. So if we're really yes, going to yeah, celebrate yes. Christmas and uh-huh. do it like the Magi yeah. did, uh huh. That's true. We should take some time. Actually, that's probably a fun podcast just, is to like talk we, about what the who oh. the who were the Magi, mm. or what the heck was the star. This is good. Oh, it was uh, Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Were the stars? Were the were the magi? They're the magi. <laughs> they are, in fact, magi. Yeah, crushing it, journeying into the filthy world of Muggles. We'll find out later. <laughs> book book eight. Uh-huh. Book eight. That sounds about right. Um, awesome. What are we talking about today, there, Fletcher? Uh, I don't. Yep, that is in fact my middle name. We yeah, also hi hi audience. It's yeah, been a while. Oh, it's been a while. Yeah, seriously, you, good. We're glad to be here. If this is your first episode, you probably um, have no idea what's going yeah, on. Yeah, we, we apologize. Thanks Why do we take so much time off? I had family in town up until literally a half hour ago. Yeah, I yeah. had family in town. I was right. moving. Yeah, moving Christmas. Thomas was ha- baptized his kid today. Yeah, that was an exciting thing that it happened. It was a great day. Yeah, yeah, it was a really good day. I guess we had family. Any, yeah, and family was in town also. But I anyway. I, I, the moment that I knew we were going to be taking a long break is when we looked and saw how we had overlapping travel schedules over Christmas. Mm-hmm. And I think Graham was the one who first saw that we'd have to record ten episodes mm-hmm. in one Saturday. Mm-hmm. And that, that seemed <laughs> that unlikely to happen. A little ominous. Seemed yeah. heavy. So that's that, a heavy episode. Load. Yeah. In fact, did not happen. So yeah. what are we? What are we learning today? I I don't know. What do you want to talk about? No. Okay. We are going to be talking about a book today, which means an old uh, shocker. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so that. so that, that means we'll have to end with a book review at some point. So, you know, f- f- four out of four stars. It was a good book. Okay. So we will be talking about a book called Climbing Parnassus. Gentlemen, is this a book that you have heard of before? Nope. No. Cool. But uh, I, Parnassus is a mountain. Parnassus is a mountain. Ding, ding, ding. How? That, one to nil. To, to be clear, I did not ask that as a question, oh. so I don't know if that counts for points, <laughs> but... Thank you. I was simply being courteous. Thank you. Him so, you know what? AJ, point you. That's exactly right. So Thank you. Points yeah, for appreciate being courteous. It. Yeah, you're in the my, my rear view mirror on the points, but okay. <laughs> nope, super courteous. I, well, I just, anyway, I like it. Can you all just both keep your own separate tally of points, even I though? I always do. Okay, that's exactly good. <laughs> that's the only reason you keep doing this podcast, right? <laughs> he won. That's a humility point. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> now there are different kinds of points? I can't, I can't do this. Okay, so book is called Climbing Parnassus. It is by an author. The author's name is Tracy Lee Simmons. It is Tracy. Does the name Tracy Lee Simmons ring a bell? No, no, nope. it does not. All right. Wow, uh, this is exciting. I, uh, I, I hope so. I think this will be whatever. I, I think all of my episodes are interesting. We'll see how you all feel about thirty minutes in. That's probably when we'll check in and see who's fallen asleep. So, um, I, Climbing Parnassus is a book. Uh, it is a book written in defense of. The of teaching Greek and Latin in school, mm. uh, specifically in defense of teaching Greek and Latin in classical schools, I think would be the best way of putting that. We'll talk through kind of his the how he starts that argument out today. Uh, I would 
I will be surprised if we make it all the way through the introduction today. I kind of have some, we'll try and guide our way through his argument in this introduction, but we're not even getting into like the, 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 the core of the book yet through this. Are you, is this going to be a two parter? It's going to be like a four parter if thing, I don't know. We'll see how far we get with this. I'm, I'll be curious today where we land on this topic and then that will probably dictate how many episodes we actually spend on this book. So, um, this, you know, over the Christmas break, I, I had put together a list of probably like seven or eight books that I had wanted to read. And I ended up spending most of my time only on this one. If you, a uh, listener, you cannot um, hear this, but uh, Graham and AJ are looking at all the spots that I've flagged inside this book. There are numerous tabs yeah. and affixed if, to that book. And I mean, there must be like a hundred things that like struck me as like important ideas that are worthy of discussing. So they're all very, they're, those are fluorescent tabs. Like it that? looks like yeah. you tabbed it at a rave. I uh, Thank you. I did. In fact, that's the only way that I read books. Uh, the other part of it is that each one of my little books of uh, tags has different colors. So you can see as I ran out of one color, it like goes into the other color. Mm, so, that's, yeah, that's beautiful. What you're looking at right there. Uh, listener, that was wonderful uh, visual uh, commentary for a podcast. So I'm glad I could do that. Okay. So I will get started with uh, who uh, who is writing this book. The author's name, as I said, his name is Tracy Lee Simmons. This is a bio I pulled from online. I think it's from the Searcy Institute. So thank you, Searcy. Tracy Lee Simmons is a writer and journalist who has written widely for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the New York Sun, the Weekly Standard, the New Criterion, Crisis, and the uh, Sewanee Review, along with other newspapers and magazines. He served as associate editor, editor for National Review under William F. Buckley Jr. Mm, okay. and is the author of Climbing Parnassus, a best-selling case for classical education in America that won a choice award for outstanding academic title in 2002. Uh, he, he was the recipient of the 2005 Paideia Prize given by the Searcy Institute for a lifetime contribution to classical education. Have you ever read Andy Buckley? I have not. No, neither have I. AJ, have you ever read Andy Buckley? Conservative uh, writer? No. Yes. But I don't... Uh, He's always on those lists. Of like books see. that we should read? Yeah, yeah. Just any sort of floating around the classical education world. He's not himself a classical scholar, but he's always sort of on those lists. Anyway. I'm trying to look. I'm just, just from Googling his books, God and Man at Yale, Miles Gone By. I don't. Uh, Maybe just because of his work at National Review. Yes, but anyway. For sure, National Review. Listeners, if you have a favorite William F. Buckley uh, work, uh, send, them, send them our way. That'd be really helpful for us to, to go through. But anyway, that's, uh, that is his background. Uh, Graham, you got into this before I asked the question. Thank you very much. But in hearing the title, Climbing Parnassus. That's two points, right? It is still negative a million. <laughs> but you said that Parnassus is a mountain. Do you, mm-hmm. know, do you know anything about this, this mountain? It's a mountain in Greece. Okay. This is good. Nailed it. <laughs> I mean, he did. That That is, in fact, the location of this mountain. Does Do we know anything else about... Uh, is there is any it, significance to this mountain? Is it the mountain that they thought the gods lived on? I don't know. No, that's Olympus. Olympus. I know, but maybe they were like, oh, that's probably it. Maybe they moved, like, had moved. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're the gods, and can't they just, like... The guy it? walked up to the top of Parnassus, and he's like, they're in here, guys. They're not here. <laughs> so they're probably over vaca- on that one. Vacation home mountain? I don't know. Um, oh, is there, like, a maybe some sort of fancy temple on top of it? Uh, it is near a famous temple. Does anyone want, uh, uh, just in case we're, does anyone want to guess what temple it is very close to? Oracle of Oracle? Delphi. Delphi, yeah. yeah. So it oh. um, it towers above Delphi. Um, so it is in that same area. So kind of central Greece, if you're looking at a map, and or if you have a great mental uh, uh, geography of Greece, good on you. So uh, so near Delphi, that's a, uh, a point to it. Uh, do you, AJ, one of your works, I believe, references it, but only kind of in passing. So this is me putting you on the spot. Sorry about that. Um, I believe Odysseus spends a little bit of time on Parnassus. He gets injured in the leg from hunting on Parnassus. Does this... Oh, even... uh, are we talking... He hunts a couple of times, but one of them is just a story he tells. It's, oh. it's when he got his boar scar. I th- think that might be it. Is that what we're talking it's about? Book 19 of the Odyssey. Odysseus recounts a story of how he was gored in the thigh during a boar hunt. Yeah, on this is Yeah, this is how he has everyone in his house identify him as actually Odysseus. He's oh, really? like, it's me. And wow. they're like, Meh! And they'd be like, check out the scar. And they're like, oh, it's you. <laughs> Sweet pig scar. Yeah. That's cool. And maybe more to the point is that uh, Parnassus is also thought to be the home of the muses. So the muses come from uh, Parnassus. Hmm. So that's the, that's the significance of why he's referencing that in his title. There's more to it, though, is to why it's climbing Parnassus. And so he, there's a, a centering image for this book that uh, I, I think we'll start with, and then we can go from there. This is page 15 if you are falling along at home. Mount Parnassus, a limestone mass hovering over the ancient shrine of Delphi, has stood as a prime symbol of poetic inspiration and perfection since the dawn of the West. 
It fixed anxious eyes on the heavens. The Castilian uh, spring, being a sacred source of life-sustaining water, trickled far below. The hushed tones of ritual echo echoed from its slopes. But over time, it came to embody those things which man at his best wishes, and ought to wish, to achieve. To uh, It became a sign of his better, divinely inspired self. To climb Parnassus was to strive after the favor of Apollo and the Nine Muses, ensconced up there forever unseen. While representing the unattainable for most pilgrims, Parnassus also pointed to those treasures bestowed by the muses upon the faithful and diligent ones who wait and work. And among those gifts most sought was the civilizing, cultivating boon of eloquence, of right and beautiful expression. Throughout the centuries to come, this forbidding image got lifted from its geographical and mythological setting to be transposed in the wake of Renaissance humanism as an emblem of linguistic flair. Climbing Parnassus eventually became a code for the painfully glorious exertions of Greek and Latin. Ah. Greek and Latin. Hmm. So to becoming eloquent in terms of language. Yes, but yes. So that's kind of the what do you get from at the end of that climb? Mm -hmm. But also uh, it, it's a very tall mountain. What he's getting at is the difficulty that's inherent in the argument that he'll be making throughout this book. All right. So, uh, gentlemen, we're a bunch of Greek and Latin scholars, correct? So we are we can, not. I'm sorry. What? Uh, what? Well, I mean, oh, yeah. how'd you guys use to spend your summer? Yeah, seriously. What <laughs> I you, learned both. Oh, so that's kind of incredible. I have very little Latin and even less Greek. Hmm. Uh, but AJ, um, you you spent years and years studying Latin. Both, yeah. yeah. So you're. I'm deeply uh -huh. fluent. Yeah. Uh, I, I I share the same level of Greek and Latin knowledge as AJ and Graham. So this is uncomfortable. So uh, three people who have not studied Greek or Latin. Well, maybe if you take. I took I took uh, biblical no yeah biblical Greek in college and then. Latin on my own in a no, m number of failed attempts. Although Duolingo has Latin now. They do. They just and it's that. pretty good. Yeah. They have Greek also, but it's not ancient Greek for whatever that's worth. Yeah. But yeah. Because Homeric and ancient Greek is different. It's like Shakespearean language to yeah. modern English. There's, yeah, there's ancient Greek, there's Koine Greek, which is the sort of New Testament Greek, mm -hmm. and then there's modern Greek. Yeah. You know. Yeah. But. Uh, okay, so it's all Greek to me, though. <laughs> hey, hey. Well done, thank you. That was really good. Okay, so <laughs> waka waka. <laughs> but the three of us are three of us work at a classical school, yep. but don't have a background in Greek and Latin. Has that ever has that ever struck anyone? Does that? Yes, it's incredibly embarrassing. <laughs> Can you say more about that? <laughs> no, it's just um, it's one of these things where you realize that the basis of your language is in this. We teach books that are translated from this. Um. And there's so much, I don't know, you, we are fans of people who have read and are, are literate in Greek and Latin. Um, Lewis um, is sort of the first one that comes to mind. And so they always speak about the joy that it is to be able to read something in the original language. And we are doing everything translated. So... Um, it sort of feels a little hypocritical when kids are like, what do we have to learn Latin? And then we give them a high-minded reason for it. And they say, oh, so do you know any Latin? It's like, no, nah, I don't. I'm your teacher and I don't know Latin very well. Sure. Um, I also bump up against the difficulties in translation. Like if, if I'm trying to think, okay, mm -hmm. what's the, why did, he, why did the author choose these words? Is there symbolism in these? Like mm -hmm. specifically in the, there's a chunk of the Odyssey where he sleeps under an olive bush and all the tone mm -hmm. seems to be one of death, right? He, he piles up a litter of dead leaves. Well, mm. litter can also mean something you carry a dead body on. Right. I doubt it was the same in Greek. And so yeah, if I'm trying to pull symbolic meanings from the passage, it's really easy for me to slip off the path and go astray because I just don't know what it was in the original. And I mm -hmm. could check multiple translations, but sometimes one is trying to maintain the rhyme. And so they're way off the map. Right. Like it's, it's astounding how much the translation can change author's original intent, right? So that's kind of what I bump up against all the time. And I really wish that I knew I could say, right. okay, this does have this kind of tone in the Greek, do you but find, I can't. Do you find that the translators normally st set that out up front to say, you know, I'm focused on this, this is my priority in this translation, or or not, I guess. Either, either they say yeah. it or you just sort of know from tradition, oh, this, this author is really trying to keep the rhythm mm -hmm. and therefore is going to just based have on take the, some pretty big um, discrepancies with the, the language. Mm -hmm. um, isn't like Alexander Pope's translation of the Iliad and the Odyssey, one that tries to maintain the cadence and the rhythm, but then is, or I don't know, there, there, there's, there's all these different... Yeah, so the, the Fagels is easy, mm -hmm. easily readable and more accessible and not necessarily meant to maintain the 
you know, high poeticism of it. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, there's all kinds of different stuff. Right now I'm, I'm looking for a translation of the secret history of the Mongols, Mm -hmm. the Genghis Khan original text. Mm -hmm. And man, they are so different. All of the, all Mm -hmm. of the different texts. Is it supposed to be Genghis Khan didn't? Yeah, Genghis Khan. Is it? I'm, I have so many questions. Anyway, I, I've always, man, I have always said Genghis Khan. Is this not correct? It's not correct. Okay. And Thomas, yeah, it's a story. In the why first, his name is? No, no, no. no. I don't know. I, I haven't even spoilers, heard Genghis spoilers. Khan. Spoilers. But oh, sorry for the okay. just Save looking it for the good looking stuff. Looking forward to it next week, listeners. Okay. There are yellow men that come from the sky on moonbeams. I think I'm you, not kidding. In the first right. seven pages, great. I have lots great. of questions. Okay. So, I think if you get to the point where you're like, oh, I wonder if this translation really is faithful to the language. If you're going to get all nerded up about translation, usually by that point, you're like, ah, I should probably just learn the language. Like if you're really cool. going to be passionate about translation, at some point you're just going to say, I'm, all of my efforts are better served in learning the language. Which, right. which you're saying is the point that you're at, Graham, and that you're at AJ? That yeah. you, okay. Yeah, I mean, yes, but I mean, I, I don't have... Yeah, this was my tension. sort of freedom to, like a f- to freedom of time right. to really put into it. Right. That's part, that's part of my tension that uh, we'll probably, I don't know, probably at the end of this book talk about of uh, both uh, coming around to an appreciation of the languages that I did not have before, but also I'm in the same boat. I don't, I don't know Latin. I don't know Greek. I, I signed up for the Duolingo Latin, but that feels uh, uh, small in the face of like the, the largeness of learning a new language. Uh, so I don't know, maybe by the end of actually, of talking through this book, we'll have come to a different place on like what it implies for us to have this appreciation. Yes. But we can go from there. So have you learned how to say my brother is from California in Latin now? Do you know how to say that? Well, does, if you follow Duolingo, you will. Is, but that's the other part. That, that's, I guess, what I mean by saying it's like the smallness of it. Uh, why am Californium. I, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't know California, why. California. <laughs> California. Like, yeah, California. Those declensions. Yeah, sign me up. But that's, I, I've, I've made the unfortunate choice of spending some time on the Latin subreddit of, of like, you know, how do you actually get into this Latin thing? And there are three members? Uh, uh, three uh, three thousand. I mean, or more. It's more than that, even. Right. It's a very active community. Really? Yes. Uh, awesome. But but all that to say that people all have very strong opinions and they all contradict each other, <laughs> which is then like, well, then I don't really know what to do. The internet. That's, that's that, surprising. That I, for you, I have to find the internet. That's exactly right. Yeah. Okay. So we've started with th- this main image of what it is to learn these languages. Uh, we've all said that we would appreciate. You're on the server. Thirty four thousand yeah. members. Yeah. Currently one hundred nineteen online. Online. That's exactly. Yeah. That's insane. Sounds, that sounds closer to it. So we've all said that we have this appreciation for it, that it would be great for us to know it. I, I'm wondering if you distinguish that. So, uh, Graham and AJ, you, you both teach uh, English. You both teach, you know, old books, which are um, for you. Mine are Gar- translated except that's what I was gonna for ask. Uh, Sir Gawain Can- the Green Knight. Do you do Canterbury? Your- yeah, but that's we do it in the Old English. You do. Or in the Middle English. Okay. Sorry, Middle English, Middle English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for your works, you wouldn't necessarily need it for what you actually teach in class. I don't have, yeah, I don't have translations except for the Sir Gawain. Sir Gawain. Yeah. And even then it's, you can kind of, fo- you can kind follow of follow it. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, I, I, this maybe makes me a cheater. I did the audiobook for Sir Gawain mm-hmm. and the first half is translated and the second half is not. And you can, mm. you can kind of get, you can listen saying. to it and it just sounds like a, I've, I had to slow it down to yeah. listen, but, but for AJ, yours, like your works are in fact translated. Yeah. I guess mostly, is it Greek? Cause it's Iliad and Odyssey. Um, I have two Greek. The only one that's not translated is Shakespeare. Yeah. And then I have real old English mm-hmm. and then I have Italian. Okay. Oh, teach them Italian. Italian there. vernacular. Yeah, there go. Medieval Italian. Yeah. Yeah. But then I'm wondering is, uh, so that's us as old people saying that we would like to know Latin and Greek. Is there some difference for the student? Is it, uh, AJ, imagine that you, instead of taking them through the Iliad and Odyssey in an English translation, you were taking them through in the ancient Greek translation that they would like have the ability to go through that. Would that be a different experience to go through with them? Do you think? I think so. Is that something, have you thought about that before of how that would look different if you did it that way? Yeah. I mean, I, we're just, I, th- I feel like I'm just missing so much, right? Yeah, sure. Just the, that polytropos is used to describe Odysseus and then also used, I think it's in Hebrews mm, I don't know. where they describe uh, yeah, yeah, Jesus, yeah, yeah. Someone. right? And so there's mm-hmm. that comparison. The man of many, manys. The man of many, manys. And so, any Greek audience hearing Polytropos would think immediately to Odysseus, mm-hmm. right? So uh, small things like that we miss that I could easily pull out from my students. And I feel like it gives you a sense of the people, right? Mm-hmm. The way that they speak, the way that their poems go, right? You sort of learn who they are. Like you learn about the e- English mm-hmm. of Shakespeare's time just by reading Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. That's good. Uh, and or I'm, I'm, we've around the school been talking a lot about Paideia, I have for many years talked about Paideia, which is also a, an important theme in the Odyssey also brought in in Ephesians. Like there, there are all kinds of 
nuances you draw out by having that kind of closeness to the original language. But I guess what I'm trying to get at with all this is that we we don't teach it that way, right? You still you teach a translated work, and you still get something from it, mm-hmm. right? Isn't it? It's still a valuable experience the students go through to read the Fagel's translation of Iliad and Odyssey, mm-hmm. to read a modernized Canterbury Tales. Maybe this is too big a question to start with, but it, would it would it be worth it for the student to learn enough of the language to then go and be able to translate for themselves those original works? In their original languages. Would it be worth it? Yeah. So, again, I can only answer that men and women who I respect in their writing, so Lewis, Dorothy Sayers, Chesterton, you know, name your name your, your greats, mm-hmm. all say how profitable and enjoyable, enjoyable it is to be able to do that. So I can only conclude that there would be some enjoyment of it. Actually, I get a little taste of this. So I bring a Latin New Testament to church Mm -hmm. and I try to follow along in the Latin New Testament when they're reading the reading for that Sunday. And you get to the, and I know enough Latin. And of course, there's so many English root words in Latin that you get to some root word and you realize, uh, you know, oh my word, that's, that's, uh, the the root word is, um, Translated this way, but the actual word is something different. I think I wonder if I have an example of it because I write them down, and oftentimes that adds a layer of um, meaning to what you're what you're listening to. So it's little things like that. It is if you've heard things your entire life, like an English Bible, right. to be able to hear it in the Greek and understand sort of if you if you have a good command of Greek and think about why why Paul was writing in this way, it, it can open it up and and give different. Lay, layers to your interpretation. Yeah. Let's see if I have an example. I'll flip through here. Do you want to keep talking while you're doing that? Yeah, go for it. Okay. So I'll take this back into the book. So I'm uh, on board for it. Hey, there we go. I Good. found one. Sorry. Um, in Matthew 5, um, they're talking about the poor in spirit. And I think the word in Latin is, is our root word for pauper. Um, pauperes spiritu. And I just sort of struck me like the poor in spirit is like a spiritual beggar, mm. like like uh, like a pauper is somebody you know. In my mind, you have this connotation of a man who's sitting at the side of the road asking for something. Whereas when I hear poor in spirit, the phrase maybe has become so I don't know tied up in other thoughts or other sermons or whatnot. But mm. just to hear it in in what the Latin says, and of course Latin is a translation from Greek. Um, just to hear just the idea of a beggar. What is a spiritual beggar? Um, anyway, that's that's just sort of an example right yeah. there. And if I knew more about what uh, that Latin root word is, uh, maybe that would be even richer. So, and that, that, just thinking of you talking about the Latin translation, that gets you closer to how the translators at that time were interpreting the Greek the translations. Greek, yeah, yeah, yeah and that, which is even interesting to from a historical perspective of like how did earlier people in the church interpret these different passages. Mm-hmm. And think. then if you know the original languages, you can, everybody loves that person that says, well, actually in the original <laughs> wait a minute, language, wait a minute. and when you're at a party and <laughs> you are that doing person, that yeah. at a party, everybody is like, we are so appreciative yeah, that naturally. you are here to tell uh-huh. us this. Uh-huh. This is good. This is in no way annoying or condescending. Yeah, this is good. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually. Okay. <laughs> Keep those good dancers and the jugglers in the back room. That's right. We got a are Latin the scholar. The part of your party? <laughs> what kind of parties are you going to where you have jugglers? Oh, dancers man. and jugglers? Oh, you guys yeah, don't man. have those no. at your parties? clearly. I need to go to your Classical parties. Classical parties, you should know. <laughs> don't talk about our other podcast. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to uh, get at this from what the argument the book is, again, laying the foundation of. In this introduction, he's still more setting, uh, defining his terms, uh, setting a stage that he'll then lay out an argument uh, later in the book. So I'll just, I'll go into it. Part of what I'm trying to get at with this is that we are teaching the great works, we're teaching great books, uh, but there's maybe, le- so we talk about how great it would be to teach Greek. We've offered Greek as an elective, but it's not like a core of, mm-hmm. uh, of the program that we teach. Uh, the high schoolers t- uh, are required one year of Latin. They can take three years to fulfill their foreign language requirement, but it's not like a requirement to, to, list, to um, study Latin for three or four years. But we've got Latin five now don't we we do four this year we sometimes have offered latin five yeah when, when we have students who four this year we have i think four students four five students, students that are doing yeah. and they're doing virgil that sounds right yeah. yeah which is awesome i mean i i love that i'm yeah absolutely all about that and they are all wonderful <laughs> they are that's uh, all of our students are all wonderful but also okay so for getting at how simmons is defining some of his terms so this is in the introduction just what is classical education 
I, uh, skipping around, once classical education pointed to an elite course of instruction based upon Greek and Latin, the two great languages of the classical world. But it also delved into the history, philosophy, literature, and art of the Greek and Roman worlds, affording over time to the more perspicacious de- devotees a remarkable, a remarkably high degree of cultural understanding, an understanding that endured and marked the learner for life. Classical education was classical immersion. Uh, today, we, t- we use the term licentiously. We apply classic or classical to anything we believe to be excellent and universal. Once I asked my field, uh, once I asked my field of study, uh, classic, oh, wait, no, uh, um, he was asking people what were classics, uh, to which my interlocutor responded, oh, you mean Dickens, Melville, and all that? <laughs> A response common and understandable now. Also, the field of classics, while still signifying the old, uh, meaning Greek and Latin to most of the intellectually inclined has been extended to em- embrace a study of the classical world innocent of the languages, uh, since we readily recognize in university course catalogs as classical civ and classical literature, both customarily indicating often fine courses of reading in translation. The chains have loosened. I mean, our intro was the classical world, yeah. the ancient world, yeah. the enlightenment, whatever we want. <laughs> yeah, but which is literally all we ever do. And even this is not a the, this book is not a classical work. I guess it is in defense of classical works. But I, I wonder what you all think about that. So his setting of a definition is to point to the history of what that kind of when we, what historically a classical, I'm using air quotes, listener education means. He points to an education founded upon Greek and Latin through which other subjects are brought in. But the, the, the focus is Greek and Latin. Is he saying that? it should be that way that we should tighten those chains a little bit or is he kind of okay with the freewheeling with Melville and Dickens and yeah here I trust inclusion th- of whoever this is on the next page here I trust that the reader will allow me the use uh, the use of the older definition of classical education as a curriculum grounded upon if not strictly limited to Greek Latin and the study of the civilization from which they arose so that's so he will use as his definition of classical education for the remainder of this book that a cor- a course of study grounded upon Greek and Latin. I mean, it's, it's an interesting thought experiment. It's kind of like, yeah, you go on to, I don't think there is a classical education Reddit, but it's, there it's, is. One, of the, it's one of those there things is. It's where not it's very like active, but it's there. some people, like obviously us on this podcast, we take a wider view and we're very much in this, what do you want to call it? Modern classical education movement. Modern, it, 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 this really is a like Christian school reform movement yes. in many ways, yes. classical education. And so we're coming at it from that side of things. But then there's always, um, uh, you know, the hardcore classicists that are like, why are we doing medievals? <laughs> you know, like mm. uh, we should, it should, it should be that's just modern, Greek yeah, and it sure. should be just Latin and school should be completely limit, limited to Greek and Latin and I don't really know how a school would look. Uh, a school nowadays would look if you had to just be Greek and Latin. If you would be able to a ever be accredited for a child to go into a college, um, just your like if you if you really had the the type of education, just, he's- yeah, the type of education that he is advocating, could you actually satisfy science requirements and satisfy math requirements? Uh-huh. And- Oh, that's interesting. I guess you would be teaching. We'll get we'll get into that later. We you would, you would be teaching those subjects differently as yes. opposed to, you know, in science for biology, saying this is meiosis, this is mitosis. Here are the here are the four steps, and here's how it all works. It it, it starts to look more like a, a historical education mm-hmm. of, uh, essentially essentially telling the story of science, which starts at a certain point. There were discoveries; those were debunked. And then that was common knowledge for a long time. And then that was debunked. And you tell that story over time, follow, but, tracing the history of biology or chemistry or physics or whatever. But by his definition, you'd have to stop at the Roman era. <laughs> uh, to only be talking about Greek and Latin. Latin, uh, Latin is used longer than the Roman era. Huh. And well, for, let me say, and the civilizations. That, and the civilizations. <sighs> yeah. It, but for the use of language, I, I mean, Latin will be, isn't Newton still writing in Latin? Latin? Yeah. yeah he like it's, so he's letting the language define where his edges are? Or is it simply the Greek? It seems like he wanted Greek and Roman culture to be the center. It's a part of it. Not the, uh, the, accessed for the purpose of learning the language. So that's that's that first quote from um, his looking down on classical civ and classical literature without learning the language as well. 
So you're onto something where he does care about the culture. You're totally right. But in the service of learning the language more deeply to, to the points of you're talking about of what those words meant in the society, in the culture surrounding like when the work was published. But we still have modern things in Latin being re- being reproduced. Like doesn't the Pope, whenever he says yes. something controversially, puts it in Latin? Puts it in Latin <laughs> so no one can read it. I'm, uh, I'm wondering if how, how this author would feel about, say, a modern work in Latin. That's like Harry Potter is that translated when, yeah. into Latin? Can I can I put or if it was originally written in Latin, would he be okay with Harry Potter sticking it into the old curriculum? That's really interesting. Is Latin simply the the language that we're looking for? Is that his criteria or is it mm, I would get I would guess no based on how he will he will spend por- so this book is like 300 pages but it's only 3 chapters and one of those chapters is primarily a defense arrangement Okay. It's also funny because each later chapter is longer than the chapter before it. So it seems like he like realizes I need to stop this book at some point, but he's just cramming it all in. Anyway, it's very funny. One of his chapters will be just a defense of classical works, Mm -hmm. which is a a chapter we would just agree with. That's like the whole point Mm -hmm. of this podcast. So we'd say, yes, the works are good. The question is the language of what are we missing by not reading in the original language? I guess is how I I put that. I think we're, we're missing plenty by not reading in the original language, but I think it's, this feels like chronological snobbery. Is is Latin any better than English? He will... So, is Latin better than English? That's complicated. No. There are things that Latin focuses on that English does not. By the end of this book... Uh, maybe I'm spoiling myself. Maybe we only do one episode. I don't know. Uh, the study of Latin will make for a better English speaker mm. is an argument he'll make later. And we can mm-hmm. flesh that out again in a later episode where um, I'm better prepared to make that argument. Uh, I had this experience. I, I did not learn Latin. I did not learn Greek. I learned Spanish in high school, in middle school and high school. And most of what I learned about the form of poetry came through Spanish, that there's a certain distance given to learning a different language where you um, can define things because everything has to be taught explicitly for a foreign language that's not taught for a, a language that you're raised with. So there, there's, something, there's something to that of you will learn better English You'll learn better logic by learning a different language. And Lat- it should be Latin or Greek because that's the foundations of our foundations. own language. Yeah. Okay. And that... Because I was going to say learning Polish might be just as good. <laughs> sure. Um, and this is uh, Dorothy Sayers later. We, we've we talked about the lost tools of learning. She says the benefits you would get from Latin and Greek, you can also get from Russian. Mm-hmm. Like that's her third option. So, so um, depending on the argument you make, if the argument is only learning the language gets you a certain skill, you're spot on. That other languages c- can accomplish that right. same skill. But then that's the question of what is your reason for learning Latin or Greek? Is it only the logic skills you get from Latin requires a certain type of precision? Get that from Russian or Polish or whatever would get that. I guess maybe there is something to be gained by studying the formal structure of language Mm -hmm. when you are already a speaker of language. So when you're a kid learning English, like a little – like a baby, like Asher, your child growing up, learning English Mm – um, he is going to absorb it just through his babiness yes. and through being immersed in it. But there's something about the formal education of language when you already have a mother tongue mm-hmm. that helps you understand that there are different ways of communicating or understanding and framing reality, mm-hmm. right? Like I remember when I was studying Greek for the first time, the idea that nouns have endings. Yes. And yes. I remember thinking like, well, shoot, my name is Graham. But in Greek, I would have my name change yep. based on what was happening in the sentence. Right. I wonder what that does to somebody, someone's identity, someone's idea of name, mm-hmm. right? Because in my, because now, like Graham doesn't change. Right. I'm Graham in the past, in the present, in the future. That is my name. My ending does. I don't have an ending. But in Greek and in Latin, you have a declension. You have your, you have your name that yep. changes. The nouns change, and so even just the fact that 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 can happen to a proper name must have some sort of bearing on how you see and understand the world. Sure. Um, I don't know. I'm not saying it's a good bearing or bad bearing. I'm just saying that it, it's, it's a different thing. So to learn a language and realize, oh, um, in, in French, you've got um, uh, you, uh, words that are either male or female. Right. We don't really have that in English. Or if we, if we do, it, you know, it's, it doesn't really change our sentence structure yeah. where it does in Latin. It does in Greek. It does in French. I don't know if it does in Spanish or not. No, not okay. pronounced. No. Um, so um, that kind of thing is helping it, just seeing how a completely different structure perceives, filters and understands and gives meaning to reality 
is, I think, a really beneficial thing. Right. It doesn't French, have to be Latin. Gendered. Yes. Right. Mm, right. It, it doesn't have to be Latin. It can um, be, you know, you can get this with Russian, you can get this with Polish. But again, with it being Greek and Latin that is the foundation of our language, right. then you you get this sort of family history. Even Middle and Old, old English have that same kind of thing mm-hmm. in the way they, they viewed the world, right? Uh, C.S. Lewis talks about this, how we, the way we talk about objects and obeying the laws of nature, yes. we talk about laws and we kind of make everything around us following a, a, a strict legal a code, societal right? legal code, yes. right? Whereas the, the medievals talked about the kindly inclining of things, right? Mm-hmm. Sure. Books fell because they were inclined to fall. Right. They wanted yeah. to go home huh. and that, the floor was their home and that's <laughs> yeah. where they wanted to go. So everything is sort of inclined to do a thing. Yeah. So the things rather, I mean, both are speaking of objects like citizens, yes. mm-hmm. right? And ours is no more correct than theirs, right? It's just a different metaphor. It's, it's just a different metaphor. And that metaphor of the medievals makes everything have desires, mm-hmm. right? Which is different than making everything o- obedient. Yeah. I think that's a fun change. My, my difficulty... Will we ever see like a change in, in that metaphor? Um, like that come back to the English language? Or? I'm just wondering, yeah, like... That's a pretty big change to have, now. That's medieval Latin or or Old English, Middle English to to modern English. Just wondering, you know, in 150, 200, maybe even 500 years, what is going to happen to the interweaving of the English language in terms of the metaphors that they used to talk about things? Well, when we find out that it's all string theory and that there are 1,300 dimensions, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure. we could say things dimensionalize. And wiggle to a certain <laughs> thing, right? It's gonna be, it'll probably be something we don't felt fully under, you know, can't fully anticipate. Yeah. My question, maybe you can. Theory was, theory was busted, huh? I, I thought don't know. string theory was busted. I don't know. Just I don't know where they are. With we're really theory. good scientists, so let me opine on that. Okay. Oh, sorry. I I'm wondering if is is he ad, so I'm I'm willing to allow him his definition of classical education that it's for the a study yeah. of Greek and Latin for the you know for the purpose of conversation. Fine. I'm I'm yeah. unsure if he's advocating for this to be what education should be. Greek, Latin, and the cultures that bore them. When you say what education should be, do you mean for everyone? Yeah. Well, I mean, even classical education. Is he advocating for just that as the education Getting and setting the- up fences against the stuff that comes later? Is that what's happening? Or is he simply saying, this is the term I'm going this to is, use? No, this is a great point. Okay. Getting on the big yellow bus, going to school, get your Latin <laughs> get Greek and Greek Latin. textbooks. The answer to that one is no. And oh. then also, I was just thinking this while you all were talking. I don't think this is an argument for Greek and Latin in favor of other languages. And maybe... Uh, in the same way that I don't think an encouragement of studying great works is to say you should never read a modern work. That the question is what is taught of what is taught to students. I think is the primary question. Um, in the same way that you can learn languages outside of school. What's the right way to say this? That there's this there's this joke that uh, I was again taught when I was in high school Spanish and the joke translated into English goes like this, that if you speak five languages, you're cultured. If you speak three languages, you're intelligent. And if you speak one language, you're American. Ha ha ha. Uh, waka waka. Thank you. <laughs> but even by his recommendation, you would be only at the three language point. What am I saying? You can still learn Spanish, French, like pick your language. That, You'll learn it easier. Yes. And, and that too, that it's almost like a, a base for then learning those other languages. It's a question of what you prioritize. Yeah. So it's not to say you shouldn't learn other things. It's what is the, sometimes we talk about pegs and filling in pegs. Like it's like, what is the base? What is the foundation? What are the pegs that you set? Hmm. I think that's closer to what he's getting at. Just, this is also kind of in the ballpark of what you were just asking about. AJ, uh, this is mm, the tireless pursuit. the, The tireless study of classics has always been to put it bluntly, an elite pursuit, a privilege of a comparative few. We should not skirt this fact. Classical education must not be patronizingly defended, must not be sold for its dem- uh, democratizing traits the way some of our allies spearheading the great books have done. These traits exist. Knowledge and understanding and taste all serve splendidly the interests of a democratic people, but they are accidental, not essential. Classics serve no class. So we should lean into our snobby Elitist. aristocratic uh, leanings? Yes. Yes. I mean, he uh, he. there's a point earlier in the ch- in the intro where he... He's at an anthropology lecture, and the the lecturer makes a joke about how snooty Beethoven's Fifth is, and the Tracy Lee Simmons is like, "Yeah, it is. Beethoven's Fifth is actually like better than other music. Like, yeah, I am elitist, and I'm okay with that." Um, is he just saying that to be like uh, hashtag 
difficult or a hashtag like like scandalous or do you think that he's does he have an argument behind that or is he just a snob like is he I, no um, like <laughs> sure. is the argument behind that their society needs people who have been educated in something that is not practical i don't know what he's trying to say you, Graham, when you gave your list of the people you respect who studied Greek and Latin, mm-hmm. those are not every man and every woman. Those are like the smartest of those. Like they are different. Uh, they are intelligent, gifted people, I guess is what I'm getting at. Sure. But Lewis and Chesterton, for example, like Lewis was not an aristocrat. He, um, I don't, he's not arguing that one must his be. His apartment was covered with an inch of ash from his brother smoking. Good that's, just, that's just kind of fun. Yeah, I like that. He thought it protected the carpet. Did did he really? Yeah, he did. Really he thought it no actually way. kept that's the carpet really. clean. He's not saying that elitism <laughs> is required to receive a classical education, but to say that a classical education is not for everyone. That's mm-hmm. what that's what he's setting up from the get go. Mm-hmm. This is the, the reason he says it is in opposition to Mortimer Adler that we've talked about. I think the Paideia proposal. He, Adler has a series of three books on the Paideia project, and what Adler means by the Paideia project is the bringing of great books into the public school classroom. That's right. So everybody from like, you know, the, the Vanderbilt children yeah. all the way down to the farmer kids yeah, of America yeah, should yeah. have this, this, this base of education. Edu- yeah. Yeah. And mm-hmm. he's saying that's not that he is saying that is not his goal that, and that, and he is saying that that's not classical education. Classical education is for the elite. Well, you can disagree with it. I mean, that's why I'm, that's why I'm throwing it out there. Is he saying historically it is, or we should keep it for the elite? I would s- probably say both. I don't think he's saying keep it because Lewis the, is a, is an example. It's not he was uh, not elite. It sounds like more he's saying those who can make it, it that, through that, classical that, education that, that. Yeah. are the elite. Yes, or they become it. Th- they are shaped into. Or they it. are shaped into these paragons of of civilization because of their study. Well, if yeah. that's the case, then we should hope that everyone gets shaped by that same. Case, but not everybody can. Right. But that's the. I, I think I'm agreeing with both of you. We should, AJ, Between yes. Us, we should, apparently. <laughs> yeah, which means that we, we're not smart enough to do it, which is, anyway, this is about. us shooting ourselves in the foot. But yeah, yeah, AJ, yes. We should We should hope everyone is, is capable of doing it, but be that either lack of capacity or lack of motivation or lack of support for doing it, for studying Greek and Latin. So this is the golden blood test. <laughs> I guess to see, but you never actually test if they have golden blood, right? You just tell them they have yeah. golden oh, blood. Oh, yeah, okay, shoot. Good. So I'm okay with that. No, they weren't like discovering these guys. Oh, he's got it. Like, yeah. if you have golden blood, you're probably not long for this world. Uh, <laughs> Again, it seems like a very serious medical condition. Yeah, wasn't really that like a Bond problem. movie? Uh, Goldfinger. Gold it's Goldfinger. Finger. I don't think he had golden blood though. <clears throat> no, but he killed the girl by painting her in gold. That is uh, an accurate statement. Can we that start a great. James Bond movie. fan cast? I'd be oh, like, yeah, heck yeah. That's our actual second podcast. So, classical movies. You should know. Can, Goldfinger. Can, are, are movies old enough to have classics in the way that we acknowledge them? There is a sure. Criterion collection. Yeah, but what does that mean? It means they so, have Criterion for the collection. For the collection. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> they're slow and boring. So I am sensing that you are not are not on board with that part uh, not, of his argument. It's hmm. Um, I figured you, Graham, as the el- <laughs> elitist of our podcast, would be uh, rip roaring for it. All right. Let's say, for sake of argument, okay. that. Society is served that it is a yeah. Society is served well if you have an elite. Is that is there an argument for that? That um, that it is a good thing if you have now. Is that elite? Are those elite in charge, or are they just these keepers of the heritage in there? Mm, they are. He by the end of this book, he is essentially using the founding of America as a defense of classical education Mm -hmm. that those who saw the problems in um, Europe and came over to the States were classically educated and, and attribute like their actions to that, their education. It's a place we'll get to through a series of arguments that I'm short circuiting. So it it might listener, you might listen and think that sounds crazy. Cause this is the aristocratic idea, right? Like, okay, we are going to, and it's essentially an arbitrary thing. Um, Fence off a certain number of families, House of Lords, people, you know, and it's a hereditary thing. And we will pour all of our time, effort, and resources into training the progeny of those aristocrats to be the best human beings that we can train. 
and we will then put those human beings in charge of society, and society will be better, best served if we have the best of the best leading us. That's essentially the aristocratic model, and eventually that becomes an unpalatable model in Europe. Yes. But the... But it's sort of this – it's ironic that he would make the claim America is founded essentially by these – whether or not they themselves were aristocrats, they had this aristocratic education. Yes. And they come and they found a nation based on classical ideals of Republican representative government but now cannot reproduce the model of education wherein to ah. continue to produce men and women of virtuous character to keep the thing going. He will say that that is reproduced for a few generations and then essentially in the, last, lost. In the last 100, 150 years. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, but kind of seeds for that destruction are sown in the in the founding itself. But maybe let me um, – just not to put words in his mouth, let me just – I'll continue with his argument. The indisputable fact is that those of, of higher culture have, perennial, have perennially constituted those few at the top who – through their gifts and privileges, have influenced disproportionately the larger society of which they are members. So he is making the argument, these aren't just uh, people who sit in libraries and guard the works. Like, these are the people leading front and center who he wants to be going through this uh, education. Who is your founding father that wanted the reinstitution of the aristocracy? Was it Hamilton? Did Hamilton want the aristocracy again? I don't know. I seem to remember, I sat in on... uh, or I was reading it somewhere. I can't remember. But there's, I mean, That'd that seems like it was an open question at right. the beginning of the country. It's like, okay, how much of uh, English society are we going to mimic? Are we going to have the sort of walled off aristocracy or not? I guess they, they sort of came down to it with being landowners. Yeah. Landowners were the only voters for a while. Was that true? Yes. Yes. Landowning males. Landowning still. males. Yeah. And then I guess that was kind of the... Uh, I don't know but that, how you but, phrase all, it. but that line of argument is where we get like where I don't like it and it's bad. Let me I'll I'll keep going with him. Still, I believe that the size of this the small group of people as a proportion of the larger literate populace need not be infinitesimal. It doesn't need to be a, a super small number of people. While initiates into classical learning have always been small in number, that number was always too small. Too small. Talent is no respecter of social status. No one with the requisite ability need be left out. Parnassus can be scaled by anyone with intelligence and curiosity who is also possessed mm. of a doggedness for detail. Gotcha. And that's that's more where, where we're going with it. So the, the, the aristocracy from like a bloodline perspective, he's not arguing for that because that's wacko. He, but he is saying that y- you have to want this to get it. Gotcha. And that uh, some level of like climbing and social standing comes from that doggedness he's talking about. Does that... Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. Those are the ones who will make it to have some type of broad influence, um, which hopefully they would be trained before. Maybe. They Do you think the, the – okay, let's say – so the dogged, the determined, those who want it, rec- go and follow and climb Mount Parnassus and receive this education. Yes. Is he saying at the end of it then they are going to be influencers of society at large? Because mm. usually those are like people that – or made fun of. <laughs> sure, for, for being total nerds. <laughs> for being like giant nerds. Maybe. Yeah, so he'll eventually draw a distinction between classical education, which is, again, a small number of people, but a, but more, but broader, mm-hmm. as opposed to a classicist or like the formal academic studying of classics. Gotcha. Which, for which he says, no, not, no, we don't need lots of people going into that. Mm-hmm. Like that's not the requirement mm-hmm. or the necessity. Mm-hmm. So it's somewhere, not everyone who gets a classical education automatically becomes a front and center political leader or something like that. But we we have talked about before that the um, pro gym nismata like the 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 end of that series of training and speaking was a political rhetoric like it, it's a speech of um, persuasion of a populace mm-hmm. like yeah the goal of politics or some sort of uh, public facing uh, activity is kind of is somewhere there in the history of classical education. What you got, AJ? You're looking at me funny. No, I got I got a couple of thoughts. Okay. I, I feel like this could go wrong in two ways. Okay. The f- way, yeah, way more than that. But, yeah, yeah, but here are, the, here are the two that I see. Yeah, the good. first is that he he seems to mistake... So, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm... Sorry, I'm, I'm stumbling all over myself. A mistake about how influence comes from aristocracy. He says the people who end up being influencers are educated in this very specific way. And I think that's not necessarily true. It's not the education that makes the aristocracy the influencers that they are of culture and movement, it's simply their status, that they are aristocrats. I think 
money and connection is far more likely to make you an influencer of culture and history than is a solid education in the books. How often did we see kings that were all about sport? They wanted to play tennis more than they wanted to learn, yep. and they changed the tide of history, yep. right? How often did we see men of action and not necessarily men of learning move the tide of countries, yep. right? I don't necessarily, I, I, I have trouble making that connection and saying that, Yes, classical learning makes for these big influencers when often classical learning shuts you in a closet and the people that are moving the world are tennis lovers. No, no, but didn't all those kings have like they were classical really learning. worried tutors yes. behind them saying like, no, you have to learn your Latin. Yeah, and he's exactly. like, ha ha, I'm going hunting. And, and so I, I would need examples of, yes, and that's the thing. Ha ha, they neglected their Latin to go hunting, right? It was that but spirit of someone. movement. We, we would need examples on yeah, either side. Sure. I, I have no examples that come readily, readily to mind of um, those who have been taught well and we've used, um, we, we all of us have given examples, but like of no names. Like uh, these are stereotypes we have of royalty before us, but I, I, I would need to come and bring those. I don't have that. In, I don't have those with me. Well, I mean, I would say, look at our aristocracy. There we go. Who is, who is, is influencing right. current culture? Kanye, mm -hmm. definitely not classically educated. Yeah. Uh, Bill Gates, also not classically educated, didn't finish college. Yeah. Uh, so technocrats. Technocrats yes. and, music and entertainers. Yeah. And was it different then? Shakespeare was an entertainer. Who knew Latin and Greek? Yeah, but... Still an entertainer, yeah, right? Sure. Just because he isn't a politician doesn't disqualify them from being a mover of culture. Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm not saying pol uh, politics is the only way to make that, that type of change. Is that... Um, no, that's not oh, what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, so the other, the other possible screwy thing I see happening is if we accept this notion that to, to succeed in classical education, it's sort of like a filter for the weak ones. And what we get at the end is, <laughs> the, is the strong ones. This seems like a really good way to mistake poor teaching mm. for unmotivated or defective students, yep. right? If we say, yeah, sure, only the elite are going to make it through, then that allows us as teachers or us as a culture to say, yeah, he just he's just not motivated enough. Well, yeah. if he's not motivated enough, isn't that a, a virtue problem that we should be able to help teach out of them, right? It's our job to teach virtue. If he's yeah. not virtuous, that's on us. Mm, yeah. I don't agree with that okay, well, fully. So? Well, because, I mean, you can, at the end, the human beings have agency, yeah, absolutely. And so at some point, at some level, we can only present an education. It's up to the student to receive it. I think you're right. I'm just, I'm not, I am, and I'm not even necessarily saying he, he's wrong, that a classical education is a filter for the weak and only the the most determined students will make it through learning two languages and studying the old books. Mm. But I am saying that if we accept that notion, we are putting ourselves in danger of dismissing perfectly capable students mm -hmm when really what we have is poor teachers. That's fair. I, there's something I wonder, though, in that his focus is on the curriculum much more than on the method of teaching, that there's something compelling in that, like, Paradise Lost is a great book, whether Graham teaches it well or not. And for someone to push through, Graham's a great teacher, but if he were a bad teacher, to push through and still find the good in that book, there is a virtue in that. Or even a bad teacher of Latin is teaching you Latin. I don't know that there's still something that the student can get or benefit from if they have the doggedness that he's talking about to climb uh, in the metaphor of the mountain. It would be a rocky patch of the mountain that it's hard to get over. It's not super fun, but it still gets you closer to the goal of what's on the top of that mountain. And I just don't know. All right. I don't know. You, you guys certainly had stuff in school where you weren't motivated to get through it because your teacher was terrible. Didn't you? Where it wasn't mo because my teacher was terrible. Yeah, I cared about grades so much that it was kind of a I wanted the A no matter who the teacher was. I just didn't. It didn't matter who the teacher was for me personally. It isn't but so you were motivated by something completely other than a hunger for the actual the knowledge. Yeah, you, sure. it, was, it was a pride thing. Yeah, this is well, pride, so well, that's complicated. But so <laughs> well, I, no, no, I was motivated because top ten percent of uh, uh, at the time is now eight or whatever for, of college schools. If you apply to a public school in Texas and you're in the top ten percent at that time, they had to accept you. Automatic. Could you minutes. say selfish ambition then? It wasn't selfish. I want to go to college. Like I, I, I get what you're saying, but it was not like uh, I eventually came to love English because I was forced to pay really close attention to right. the books because I wanted an A. But my initial motivation was not. I really love these books. It was, I want the A. I, I agree with you on that part. So, but my point is that if the students that get, are getting through are not necessarily the, the elite, right. in that case, if, it, if your pride happened to motivate you all the way through, mm. then 
it would be our, our prideful students or our ambitious ones. Could be. Which is not necessarily our most yeah. virtuous. Yeah, this maybe gets into um, the... Uh, so when Graham did a review of uh, something they will not forget, I mean, that, that might have to do with how do we test this knowledge? Is it in a way that a prideful... Do we, do we test their virtue in a way that a prideful student could pass that test? Do we test their knowledge yeah. in a way that a... Um, name your sin, uh, uh, right. that a vicious student, a student with vice could could pass, mm-hmm. and hopefully not. It is telling that we only have four students in our highest level Latin class that we offer. Mm. Uh, I, I know, it's just, and I know them, and knowing them, they're not doing it because they want they're selfish to, ambition, to, right, yeah. or they're like super jacked up about the Latin right. AP test. Right. They're actually, they've crossed over into some sort of love of the thing itself. Yeah. I think that's true, even though you, you talk to them and they sort of have a gallows humor about Virgil right. and about translating. Mm-hmm. Deep down, like, when they're picking their courses, they took that because there is something formative and enjoyable about right. that high level of doing something difficult in Latin. So what we're trying to say, audience, is that if this is true, that means you are the elite. <laughs> you're yeah, still, sure. yeah, naturally, you're still yeah. here doggedly chasing <laughs> for, just for the love of books. This is good. Although we haven't been teaching Latin or Greek or... But don't you want, don't you want to learn yeah, Latin and Greek? Learn and don't Latin you want to learn yeah, Latin and Greek? Course, I mean, yeah. and so do I. And why? Not because like that's where the money is. No. <laughs> and, um, I, because the idea of reading Thomas Aquinas in the original Latin sounds awesome. It sounds awesome. And now, well, uh, again, having taken Spanish, reading Don Quixote in the original language, I remember being really excited going to Spanish five and then about, you know, a page into it being like, what have I done? Mm. Like, because it's actually really hard, but making it through to the other side of that was actually really exciting. Yeah. You don't like donkeys? I love them. They're great. But uh, in the same way that we're talking about the differences of like uh, old old English, Middle English, modern Eng- English, there's an old Spanish, a middle Spanish and a yeah. new Spanish. Yeah, yeah. And and listener who we are compressing lots of what is Latin and Greek. Graham mentioned the the differences of types of Greek. There are also different types of Latin mm-hmm. and different rules that based on what you're following. Anyway, um, so, yeah, these are introductions. This is all to say that future episodes Hopefully we'll remember to say this, but when he's talking about classical education, um, Tracy Lou Simmons is talking about an education focused on the study of Greek and Latin. Graham, to your question of are there schools that will accredit that, that's the requirement for ACCS schools, yeah, Association yeah. of uh, Classical Christian Schools, that they teach um, four years. I think it's I think there were, you have to teach four years of Latin, I think four years of Greek also, but mm. that's split, I think, between the School of Dialectic or Logic mm. and School of Rhetoric. Um, so, so yes, there are schools that accredit and still do that mm-hmm. um, yeah. even today. Cool. Well, thanks, Thomas. Yeah, thank you. So that is the intro, which is only like thirty pages of this three hundred page book. So get excited. So oh, cool. So, so we crushed it. Get, yeah, yeah exactly. get ready. Yeah, seriously. So this has been classical stuff you should know. Although, if we really were classical stuff you should know, we would have to only be talking about Greek and Latin. So we probably need yes. to come up with a better name. Or a different name for the podcast, get rebranding that whole thing. Yeah, good, thanks. Um, but for the time being, this has been classical stuff you should know. Um, classical you, stuff you should know. Good, yeah, yeah. You can Way. email us at <laughs> classical stuff at veritasacademy.net. You can find our episodes at classical stuff.net. You can tweet at us at classical stuff, C L S S C A L stuff on the Twitter sphere. I will tweet back at you. Probably not. Um, we will either AJ or I will respond to your emails I and Thomas will read them will and read then them. click the unread yep. so that Thomas, so that AJ and I will answer yep. them. Right, yep. right. Yep. And we thank you so much for listening. It's good to be back on the saddle, boys. Yeah, Great to be back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, this is uh, good. This is really yeah, good. This is good. Uh, and we will see you next time. This is Graham, AJ, and Thomas signing off. Bye. Bye. Bye.